Welcome back as we continue with the introduction of Unforeseen Beast and the search for the meaning of our, of our age. And just really quick here, uh, if you click the link on the description, you'll get more details on the actual book, 618 pages. I'd like to say around 112 or so illustrations. So continuing on with the introduction. But truth be told, these things were not so special, except that I experienced them with a lucidity most uncommon. And it was this lucidity that led me hither and thither, up and down this and that street, until there by the powers of fate, or something interchangeable or equivalent with fate. And here I'd like to quickly note that we're talking in later chapters, we're going to be getting into Gurdjieff, talking about how fate actually has to do with astrology and how people still continue to believe in this to this day. Okay, the lighting's not, is somehow not getting back here. Which is too bad because it's taking a little bit too long to get the lighting back to where it should be. There. There by the powers of fate, or something interchangeable with fate, I haphazardly come across a curious book by the spiritual teacher Ted Andrews. Specifically, I find this book in one of those free little library okay this is not really work this is really not working this doesn't focus as fast as i thought it would oh okay i want to go to the controls really fast here Just a second put it back on default maybe that way it'll work if it's just on default all right sorry for the slowdown Book exchanges, the free little library book exchanges that one can find all over Beloit, Wisconsin. You know, the ones that look like somewhat like house-shaped mailboxes. And these things are all over Beloit, actually, if you, as opposed to... Continuing on, in this book titled Dream Alchemy, Ted Andrews argues in favor of maintaining a dream journal for the purpose of gaining insight from one's higher self. After reading the first four chapters straight through, I begin to entertain this idea of a higher self. Furthermore, I also return to the idea I mentioned earlier, that is, the idea of my true inner self. Obviously, I ask the following question, which quickly turns into several questions. I ask, To what extent... Or perhaps to what degree activate windows go to... I've already done that. I bought this computer off, off Amazon. I, to what extent or perhaps to what degree is my true inner self different from my higher self? Is there any way to close the distance between these two categories? Wait a minute. What exactly is one's higher self? or true inner self for that matter. And the more I continue to think about these things, the more I think about the possibilities to be found within the usage of the book Dream Alchemy. My higher self. I muse upon this possibility with a conflicting, conflicting mixture of incredulity and magical thinking. But after a short reflection, I find that the novelty factor here proves too tantalizing an option for me to pass up. Besides, it's not like there can be a bad result except for the possibility of feeling silly. But who cares about that? Well, why not, I tell myself. I'll give it a shot. I begin with the exercise explained on page 98 of Dream Alchemy with the exercise called The Magical Butterfly. In this exercise, one must visualize just before entering sleep that he or she is within a cocoon from which he or she will emerge as a butterfly upon entering the dream state. That very night, I attempt the Magical Butterfly exercise carefully following the instructions just as they are described in Andrew's book. And success! I experience the surreal existence of being a dream butterfly floating through a semi-astral realm. Specifically, I am a fritillary butterfly. I am a fritillary butterfly in this dream. Needless to say, I am light, ethereal, and everything that goes with being an alchemical butterfly. What next happens is particular to my mission in this realm. That is to say, I believe it's so. 
I am met with several existential oddities so peculiar that only presenting you with a picture of them can do justice for the purpose of my rendering a forthcoming explanation. As you can see, I come across what appears to be to be a sorcerer penguin who is conjuring a tornado. He speaks to me condescendingly as I pass over him. Trivial human, why are you trying to preemptively gain an advantage over me before our real encounter and official conflict? What do you mean by real encounter, I ask, bewildered. Isn't this a real encounter right now? The penguin scoffs at me before answering. Wow, really? A two-second pause ensues. If this were a real encounter, don't you think that, that the mighty gusts from my F3 tornado would have swayed your trajectory with an undeniable power? Oh my, you're right, I say in agreement with the bird. However, my very act of agreeing with him changes my location within the dream realm. My eyes shift involuntarily. Everything in my perception shifts, and I am now viewing something of an entirely different subject matter. But what is this? A red-headed female apparition? One that kind of looks like a creepy ornamental doll. See picture below. Of its true identity, I'm not certain, but I suspect that it's my spontaneous preconception of the crone archetype. You know, the elderly and wise female sil symbol described by Carl Jung, the one who seeks to provide us with balanced wisdom. Source, Ted Andrews, Dream Alchemy. And what is this representation of the crone archetype standing next to? Why, it's none other than a copy of Ted Andrews' Dream Alchemy book, the same one whose exercises I'm now diligently following. The female form says to me, I am not a, <clears throat> I am not a represent, excuse me, I am not a representation of the crone archetype, but I do appreciate that you are trying to incorporate this type of information into your thoughts and creative life. In fact, most human beings would do well to study the uniquely human categories of knowledge such as mythology, psychology, history, etc. This is especially true in a world like yours where technology is increasingly usurping many of the activities formerly held within the exclusive domain of human action. Oh, I get it, I respond. You're saying that human-centered creativity will be the best pathway for a person to contribute to society in the future. This is because robots will increasingly be called upon to do the repetitive, pre-scripted work, thus freeing up humans to do the creative stuff. That is what you're saying, isn't it? Not at all. Human creativity cannot sustain the coming surge of robotic and commu computer capacities for imitating human-like activities. For example, have you not heard the music of the soulless genius of Emily Howell, that demiurgically potent AI music program whose number two fugue in her From, Light, From Darkness Light resonates with all the archon-like cadence of a Gnostic prophecy concerning the inherent, concerning the inherent darkness and trapped light of this world age? Note to the reader, Emily Howell, Emily Howell music com is a music composing computer program created by David Cope. However, here the red-headed doll-like apparition seems to draw a parallel between Emily Howell's music and Gnosticism, perhaps pointing out that Emily Howell, although a dead entity, can still produce something bearing the creativity and generative nature of the light, that is to say the divine spark perhaps by means of the Gnostic mystery which permits the light of life to be mysteriously trapped in an unholy dead matter. Further note, the idea of a lifelike counterfeit which lives not, not but can appear to be, the idea of a lifelike counterfeit which lives not but can appear to be living will be explored further in our discussions of transhumanism and its role in the future of scientific progress and its possible limitations. In fact, this is where the hideous ones, the henchmen of the henchmen of old kitten, which is a creature which has not yet been we haven't introduced yet, but excel in the powers of disputation. But these characters will be hitherto delineated at the appropriate time. 
I don't get it. So what you are trying to say, so what are you trying to say when you tell me that most human beings would do well to study the uniquely human categories of knowledge? Speaking to the crone archetype, looking dull. All I'm trying to say is that when humans study distinctly human domains, they then they are, at the very least, enriching their minds properly and not just seeing themselves objectively as cogs in a world guided solely by the hierarchies of Darwinian evolution. A system which, ironically enough, is destined to be dominated by robot intelligences. That is to say, this will be the case unless humans don't take active steps to keep things humanistic as opposed to robotistic. The dullish apparition then pauses like one who needs to take a large breath for having spoken such a long, in such a long-winded manner. But in this case, the entity in question is a doll-like creature, so no actual breath is taken or necessary. The doll continues to speak. At any rate, human, your, in your particular case, the spirits have informed me that if you will derive great, that if you will derive great, nay, miraculous benefit from... Guidelines provi- the guidelines provided in Ted Andrews' Dream Alchemy. In fact, by doing this, you will come into an understanding of the truth, and that you, and that you attain this understanding is demanded of you by them. Who is them? I ask cautious, uh, cautiously. But it is already too late to receive a satisfying response. However, the apparition leaves me to awaken from my sleep with a twofold gain: a sense of wonder for what has just happened, and the weight of great expectations for future insights that will be obtained in future visions of the night. And so I resolve to meticulously follow the process that Ted Andrews outlines in, in, the book Dream Alchemy. And what happens soon after this decision is more than I could have expected. In fact, my dreams now gain a quality so vivid, surreal, insightful, uncanny, and truth-revealing and I'm now impelled to share these experiences with you personally. Yes, I, an unsuspecting student of theories and histories, have received insights not from books or articles as is the common route, but from the ancient mode of dreams, or rather to employ the prophetic phraseology, visions of the night. Note, biblical reference, this will come to bear in a future chapter where it talks about how this relates to the book of Daniel, or in terms of a strange illusion, Now, for anyone who would dismiss all this as just creative pipe dream, ask yourself the following question. Under what other scenario could hundreds of metaphorical and otherworldly creatures have addressed to me the real facts, the real events and real histories that are rapidly transforming our world into the stuff of science fiction and futuristic dystopias, or maybe maybe utopias? Although it doesn't seem so. In any case, the strange creatures, the unforeseen beasts, would not leave me alone as they demanded that I look at the plethora of sources, facts, metaphors. In short, they desire to elucidate the great perils and promises that are presenting themselves before our very eyes. And so, with the year 2019 before us, I thank you for joining in on this trial of visions, speculations, and psychical forays into real research and solemn prophecies as they're presenting themselves today. And to reify this special moment in historical reality, I thought, they thought, they thought, the following image to be appropriate. For considering 2019 and all of its strangeness. And what should we call this vision? Hmm. Let's call it the following, the emergence of the year 2019, a time of watering or fruition. Chapter zero, the prologue. Okay, so in the next chapter, in the next, um, in the next video, we're going to go over the, we're going to go over the, the, basically begin the book proper. Thank you for just joining me as as we, uh, as we've read the introduction and kind of introduced some of the basic ideas that we're going to go over um in the in the book proper